thank you everyone um, for joining us at our earlier session time and we do really appreciate you being flexible. Um, we will be releasing the recording straight away afterwards for those of you who will watch this afterwards. Um, we have your questions, they will be answered. Um, but first we have a few housekeeping rules. So I'm Megan from the Pituitary Foundation. Uh, a few things you need to know before we start today is that we have enclosed uh, enabled closed captions. So if you'd like them, just click the CC uh, button at the bottom. And I'm sure you guys have all heard this spiel before as we are at the almost at the end of Awareness Month, but I'm just going to do it one more time in case anyone who's joining us is new today. So for anyone who is not familiar with the Pituitary Foundation, we provide support for the 70,000 plus people in the UK who are affected by disorders of the Pituitary gland, as well as their families, friends and carers. We want to ensure that every person affected by a pituitary condition has a timely diagnosis and access to the high quality treatment, information and support available. We have a dedicated nurse helpline, online and printable resources, and we work with leading medical experts to improve patient care. Um, like I said, it is part of Awareness Month and I'm really excited to be having this talk as part of our Awareness Month programme. Um, for anyone who is not using visuals today, uh, I am a young woman in her mid-twenties, just about, um, with blonde hair. I have a black uh, turtleneck top on and gold uh, circle glasses. Um, like I said, the session will be recorded and will be uploaded to our website permanently later in the year. Um, no one's faces or comments will be visible unless you want to ask a question and have your camera on. If you want to ask a question without your camera on, you are absolutely you know, allowed to do that. Um, or if you don't want to talk at all, please just type your question into the chat. Um, what else? We want to ensure all our events are welcoming and accessible for all, especially as we may explore personal experiences in this session. So to this end, please can you remain on mute when not talking to manage background noise? Um, like I said, you don't need to have your camera on if you prefer not to, but it is lovely to see those who feel comfortable with it. Um, you may wish to add pronouns to your name, um, so we know how to refer to you, as you can see uh, I have done below. Um, to chat, please either use the chat bar or raise your hand at the end, well, throughout really, when we are doing the questions, um, and you will be spotlighted. So please be respectful as people share personal views and experiences. Uh, the session will finish at seven o'clock today, um, but if you need to finish or leave the session early, this is completely fine. You don't need to say anything. Please just feel free to leave. Right, that is everything now. Thank you very much for listening to me do the uh, intro one last time. Uh, I'm now going to hand over to our brilliant uh, speaker today, uh, John, who will be taking all of your questions from here. So over to you. So good evening, everyone. Um... So thank you very much for the introduction. So I'm John Your Price. Uh, I'm Professor of Endocrinology and an Endocrinologist in Sheffield. And I head up our, our service. A um, couple of other housekeeping rules. I'm afraid, Megan, it's going to be slightly shorter than seven o'clock because I've got another commitment I've got to get to. And um, the other piece of housekeeping is that you sent in questions here or people have sent in questions. I'll try and get through all these questions and then address as many more as I can do afterwards. If you've got outstanding questions after that, if you cascade them to Megan, I'll try and answer them by email. The other comment I would make is I can only answer some things in generalisms. I can't necessarily always address a particular problem because to do that, I'd need to have all the information. And also, it's just not appropriate because if you do have particularly outstanding things about your own um, care or the care of, of, of someone uh, for whom you're very close to, a relative, then I think it's really important you raise those issues with whoever's looking after them rather than uh, relying on something I say with just, just some of the information here. So with that sort of disclaimer, as it were, I'm going to go through the questions. What I'm going to do is I'm going to read them out um, and, uh, and then ask, hopefully answer the question. And then if, if I'll just sort of ask if there's any, if that's answered the question, and if not, I'll try and clarify it, if that makes sense. So let's start. Uh, these things normally go uh, pretty pretty quickly and we try and get through quite a lot. So my daughter, uh, brackets, 25 years of age, has got secondary adrenal insufficiency. So for those of you who don't know, secondary adrenal insufficiency means that the pituitary is not making the hormone ACTH that then drives the adrenal gland to make cortisol. 
And the etiologist, the, the question says is unclear, hasn't had any prior steroid use. And that's important because prior steroid use is the commonest form of an underactive pituitary because you're on high enough doses of steroids to, to switch off the pituitary. This was diagnosed in 2018. There is undetectable cortisol and ACTH at the last check, and there was no response to a synactin test. And currently, they're taking 20 milligrams of hydrocortisone daily. It was found unresponsive last week. Paramedics connected fluids due to the current wait time crisis in Edinburgh. Six hours later, when I was allowed through to the holding pods, she hadn't been connected to those fluids and was feeling terribly dizzy. Fortunate to have a very good endocrinologist who's going to help set up a care plan for next time. Any a &E advice that might help advocate when the patient, when the adrenal patient isn't feeling well enough uh, to our family member who isn't allowed to go, isn't allowed through to be with them during the current protocol, etc. So this question is really touching on an incredibly common, unfortunately, clinical scenario where someone with adrenal insufficiency gets through to A&E isn't given the hydrocortisone they need, isn't given the fluids that they need, and it's a real problem. So what's been done? So I can tell you what's been done nationally. There is a steroid card which has been launched, which you'll be aware of. There is uh, many ambulance services around the country have people registered with adrenal insufficiency on their register, but that's not uniform across the whole country. And now we're talking about Scotland. So I'm not entirely clear as to what um, Scotland is, is, is doing. And it is uh, unfortunately still the case that people are not getting the treatment that they need. What we are doing as doctors is, uh, or rather as the Pituitary Foundation uh, has just written or is about to write to the College of Emergency Medicine, which oversees accident and emergency, to highlight this issue uh, and the signatories of that are the CEO of the Pituitary Foundation, myself and Professor John Wass, to try and emphasize the need for this to be done. How else can you do it in the interim is, is simply to emphasize that uh, patients. And what I would advise doing is carrying the steroid card, carrying the information that the Pituitary Foundation has in people's wallets so this can be shown to the doctors and to emphasize the need. Uh, should this happen? No, of course it shouldn't. It's still an ongoing problem, which, which many of us are still very frustrated, hasn't been resolved. So I haven't got a solution other than keeping some written information to say that whoever they are has an absolute requirement for hydrocortisone and an absolute requirement for fluids if unwell. Beyond that, it's going to be continuing uh, lobbying from both patient support groups like the Pituitary Foundation and also from us in the, in the medical profession. We're trying to do a, a lot of this, but despite doing that, unfortunately, it's, it's still an issue. Uh, I hope that answers the question. And if it, unless I see otherwise, Unless Megan tells me otherwise, I'll move on to the next question. No, you're all good. I was just going to chime in there quickly, John. Sorry to interrupt. Um, on Thursday, actually, we are releasing um, another session about um, A&E and going to A&E with um, Catherine from the Association of Ambulance Chiefs and Pauline, our endocrine nurse. So they go into a lot more detail as well. Brilliant. So um, there you go. So <laughs> tune into that one. Fantastic. Next question is, uh, I have a macroplaxinoma which is stable in size. I was diagnosed 14 years ago and I've tried all different medications, but all do not lower my prolactin levels. For the last few years, I've been looking to make sure my other hormones are okay. I've accepted my prolactin remain high. I've heard uh, moving on to HRT is good as my estrogen levels have always been low, even when on the contraceptive pill. Would this be something you would recommend to ensure my other hormones are doing okay or anything else? So there's, there's quite a lot in that. So the first thing to say is that most of the time, patients who have got a large macro uh, prolactin, uh, prolactinoma, so this is a larger tumor, uh, more than a centimeter in size in the pituitary secreting prolactin, most of the time they respond pretty well to different dopamine agonist drugs, the commonest being cabergling, but, but not always. And, and sometimes people, uh, people have tumors which are resistant to that. Uh, the other dopamine agonists we use, which are bromocryptine and quinagulide, are less convenient and typically less effective than cabergoline. Some people can't tolerate it because of side effects. 
Sometimes it doesn't work because the tumor is just resistant. The question then is, is, well, what is one trying to achieve by treatment? So if you've got a large tumor that's causing problems from the size of the tumor, and it's, for example, pressing on the visual nerves, and it's not responding to dopamine agonist, occasionally we have to recommend surgery for those people because, of course, it hasn't responded to the dopamine agonist, it hasn't shrunk down. If there's no problem from the size of the tumor, then the question is, what impact is the high prolactin having on the rest of the pituitary function? And as written down in this question, often the high prolactin level suppresses in women estrogen and in men testosterone. And the issue then is that one can replace those hormones uh, at really any age, whatever age is appropriate, but one has to be careful to make sure that these hormones don't then cause an increase in the size of the prolactin secreting tumor. So if you've got a woman who has got a large tumor, for example, it may have shrunk somewhat on the uh, dopamine agonist. Perhaps the prolactin levels are still high, but as long as it's shrunk and isn't too big, one can introduce estrogens if the prolactin isn't low enough to allow the body's own estrogen production. But you have to monitor with scans to make sure that the estrogen itself doesn't cause a further increase because estrogen can cause an increase in the size of a prolactin secreting tumor if it's not controlled. And actually in men, when you give testosterone, some of the testosterone can be converted to estrogen in the men, and that can then cause an expansion of the size of the tumor. If the size of the tumor itself isn't a problem, if the prolactin levels are high, if it's not causing problems like milk from the breast galactorrhea, then yes, you can have either estrogen if you're a woman or testosterone as a man, even if the prolactin is still high. And that can be titrated to whatever levels required, but you may well still need to have um, scans done to monitor. The situation is a bit different. For example, if you've got a small tumor that's not causing any problems, uh, and for example, uh, a woman may come to a postmenopausal age, the prolactin has been suppressed before the menopause to allow the normal periods to occur after the menopause when the periods aren't going to occur because the ovaries are no longer um, working. In that situation, you don't necessarily need to keep on with the dopamine agonist. You can just have the estrogen replacement therapy and you don't worry too much about the prolactin if it's been coming from a small tumor because these small tumors don't typically get bigger. In the questioner's uh, case, then um, this is a bigger tumor and so you would almost certainly need to have this monitored um, by, by a scan. And then in terms of the question saying, well, my estrogen levels be being low even when on the contraceptive pill, the estrogen levels themselves on the pill, if the contraceptive pill contained estrogen, the estrogen wouldn't actually be low, but the estrogen that's measured in the blood test may not have actually recorded the type of estrogen that's in, in the pill. Uh, there are a few chats. Um, um, okay, I'll come on to those later, I think. Um, Megan, have I sorted that question out? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I'll carry on to this. The next question is, my question is about potential side effects of growth hormone brackets, genotropin injections. I take 0.8 milligrams daily. My IGF-1 is in the upper third of the range, mostly though drop sometimes. The level isn't very stable. Neither is my uh, T4. I have issues with cramps and loss of strength in my hands, along with some tingling electrical impulse sensations. Sometimes my rings feel a bit tighter, but this isn't any marked swelling or fluid retention in my hands. No obvious cause has yet been found. I did try reducing to 0.7 milligrams, but had recurrence of low GH symptoms. Could GH be causing the symptoms I described? I don't think so. I think that's unlikely. If the IGF-1 uh, isn't above the age-adjusted reference range, now, of course, it could be that someone has a particular sensitivity to the growth hormone, but those uh, types of symptoms, particularly if you're getting electrical impulse suggestions, I'd be more concerned with those any problems in the neck or the uh, vertebrae causing problems um, in... in um, in actually giving those sort of electrical tingle, these things. If people are on too much growth hormone, yes, you can get swelling of the joints, you can get swelling of the fingers, but it doesn't sound like that's uh, actually uh, the case here. The next question is, is, could switching to another preparation help? I think that's unlikely. Um, so occasionally we've had people switch from one growth hormone preparation to the other. 
uh, and symptoms change. Um, I think if you've been on genotropin for a long time, and these are more recent symptoms, then I'll be looking for another cause for those symptoms. Shall I move on? Yeah, okay. Next question. Now this, this question, I'm afraid I, I don't have an answer for, um, but it's an important question and it's one often people raise. The question is, an EpiPen would be an improvement on the current injection necessary for a crisis for my son who has adrenal insufficiency and runs marathon and rock climbs. Is there a chance in the fairly near future of having one or anything we can do as fundraisers to further its progression? So one, assume, one would assume that it should be a fairly simple measure of just getting an auto injector, which is the EpiPen and having some hydrocortisone in it. And lo and behold, you'd have an automated injection for hydrocortisone. And many of us would love to see that. The problem is, is that some pharmaceutical company or some company has got to actually get around to doing that. And it's not just a question of making the injection. It's a question you'd actually have to do studies to demonstrate that the injector was doing what it said in someone and making sure that sufficient levels of cortisol were being uh, invoked by it. You'd assume that would be easy to do, but actually it's quite expensive. There's a lot of uh, legislation that has to go around it. And so that's why it's stalled um, so far. And I, 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 I think it'd be brilliant if someone would take this. I think the reason it hasn't happened so far is because companies have looked at this and decided that there probably isn't enough money in it for them to actually make it worth their while. And one could argue that, for example, a government should take this on and, and, and produce it. And that's a particularly decent argument. The trouble is no one's actually done it yet. Um, so, yes, I think it'd be a fantastic idea. Uh, but no, I'm afraid I don't have a solution. And it's something which I know has been discussed for at least 15 years, probably. Um, and, and that sounds a bit defeatist, but it, it is not something which I know is being progressed, unfortunately, at the moment. Next question. Um, uh, the UK, in the UK, most people with primary adrenal insufficiency are treated with hydrocortisone rather than prednisolone. However, research suggests that a low dose of prednisolone better mimics the body's natural cortisol curve, whilst hydrocortisone produces high peaks. What is Prof. Neil Price's view? Okay, well, I, I don't quite agree with the interpretation of the research here. So I think it's important to say that seeing the level of a particular something you're measuring in the blood doesn't necessarily need an equate to the actual action that that's having. So let's take prednisolone. The data mainly come from West London, which has been doing this and proposing that three milligrams of prednisolone may be an alternative. And yes, it is an alternative. The issue is that when you look at the day curves, yes, you get a fairly smooth day curve of prednisolone, but the way that prednisolone works, although it is a synthetic glucocorticoid, is very different to the way that hydrocortisone, which is cortisol, exactly the same as your body makes, is very different. And if you look at the way these drugs work, they get into cells, they bind things called receptors within the cells, they um, bind the receptor and that receptor goes to have an action in the cells. And that can vary in a very dynamic fashion. And that dynamics is very, very different for cortisol or hydrocortisone compared to prednisolone or compared to things like dexamethasone. And we reckon, recognize, for example, that dexamethasone has a lot of problems with metabolic side effects. Prednisolone has fewer, but still has some. So I don't agree that research suggests that prednisolone better mimics the body's natural cortisol curve. I think what the research shows is that when you take a dose of prednisolone, you get a peak that's a bit smoother and a bit later than you get with hydrocortisone, and it lasts a bit longer. But that doesn't mean the action is the same. So I would, at the moment, still suggest that people are mainly treated with hydrocortisone. Uh, and there's lots of very, very elegant data, a lot coming from Stafford Lightman in, in uh, Bristol, looking at cortisol dynamics. And the problem we have at the moment is there's no way of giving hydrocortisone in a pulsatile way that we normally get in normal physiology. So whatever we do, unfortunately, won't mimic precisely um, what, what, what goes on if people don't have a problem with their pituitary. Now, having said all that, I do have some patients who are on prednisolone rather than hydrocortisone. And the reason for that is often for uh, terms of simplicity uh, and ease, 
uh, and um, those are the main reasons why. And so I'm not averse to thinking about prednisolone. It's just that at the moment, uh, I think the, 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 the data that there are from a physiological perspective, I feel still a more reassuring for hydrocortisone, accepting the fact that you do get these peaks and troughs. Some of the uh, more recently developed delayed release hydrocortisones, I think, are hopefully where, where things will change uh, and improve. Um, next question. What research evidence is there on the effects of HRT on a prolactinoma postmenopause? I've, I've sort of addressed that, but I'll, I'll do it again. Background information, if useful. I have a prolactinoma with hypopituitarism and secondary hypothyroidism. I'm taking cabergoline but this has not had any impact on my prolactin level or slow growth in tumor sides. I'm taking HRT. So the first thing to say is um, prolactin secreting tumors are different from having a high prolactin in the presence of a large pituitary tumor. Because you, if you've got a prolactin secreting tumor, often the prolactin can be many thousand, and if you have a large non-functioning pituitary tumor, because it presses on the pituitary stool, you can still have an, a prolactin often uh, in, in the several thousand. Now, in those patients, when you give cabergoline, usually the prolactin's made very, very low, very, very quickly, but the tumor doesn't tend to shrink, or if it does shrink, it only shrinks a small amount. Whereas the prolactin secreting tumors, if they're responsive to the cabergoline, uh, will usually shrink down, the prolactin level will lower. And the reason it shrinks down is because the size of the tumour is largely due to stored prolactin and the cabergoline switches that off. So in this particular scenario, if the cabergoline is being taken, if the dose of the cabergoline has been high enough and been used for long enough, then if the prolactin level is still elevated, that would suggest there is resistance to the dopamine agonist. And Therefore, the level of hormone won't uh, drop. And if you're premenopausal in a woman, it's likely then the periods won't return. But then it comes back to this question which I raised or this point that I raised in the first thing. It depends on why someone's being treated. So you can have a, you know, a, a moderate sized tumor within the pituitary uh, fossa that's underneath where the eye nerves are without it necessarily itself causing a problem. And in that circumstance, if the prolactin is high, it doesn't matter. You can give uh, HRT, uh, estrogen for women or testosterone for men, as long as you're monitoring what's going on with the treatment to make sure there hasn't been an expansion um, in the size of the tumor. In contrast, as I mentioned on the other question, if you've got a small tumor in the postmenopausal area, most of the time we would stop the cabergoline because running a prolactin of several thousand isn't going to cause people harm. Unless, of course, they start developing symptoms with you know, milk from the breast or that, that, that type of thing. And that can occur in both men and women. But in postmenopausal women with a small tumor, we'd normally stop the prolactin. And if we need HRT, well, then HRT. But otherwise, um, uh, with this particular scenario, if the HRT is being taken and the prolactin level is, is still um, high, that doesn't matter. Although I'm a bit concerned here is when it says, or slow the growth in the tumor. So if the tumor is growing, I'd be pretty concerned about being on HRT if, if the tumor is getting bigger. So I think that that's something definitely to raise with the endocrinologists you're seeing you, making sure that, that that's being looked after. But one hopes that scans have been done to, to check for that. Um, Next question. In treating a patient with Cushing's where surgery and radiotherapy have failed, would you recommend long-term, possibly lifetime treatment with Batarapone, or are there any drawbacks to this? But the answer is, um, if the Cushing's is well controlled with Batarapone um, and it's working well and people can afford to wait for the radiotherapy to have an effect, it can take many, many years for the radiotherapy to have an effect because it doesn't always work, unfortunately. And the other thing is, is we're always trying to uh, restore the normal rhythm of the cortisol, and that can be quite difficult, but it is possible to sort of mimic it to a certain extent by giving higher doses of metarapone in the evening. Um, is it lifelong treatment? Uh, can be, depending on the age of the patient and, and how they're doing on the metarapone. Uh, the main drawbacks is that people remain on, on tablets, but of course, in this scenario, the alternative uh, is mainly likely to be down to either considering bilateral adrenalectomy 
There are other treatments uh, such as baziriotide, which can be used, but unfortunately around about three quarters of patients uh, get either diabetes de novo or worsening diabetes. So that's, that's tricky uh, to do. And I've been involved in the studies on baziriotide. And whilst I think the studies are very, very good, unfortunately the drug isn't as, as, as revolutionary as we'd like it to be. The next question here is where Cushing's has caused severe muscle wasting, can this damage be halted or reversed? And the answer to that is, Usually, as the Cushing's has been improved, then the muscle wasting over time will tend to improve, but it can last a long time. So what cortisol at high levels, what it does is it, it causes protein wasting. It causes the protein in the muscle to be, to be wasted away. And so that can take a long time to recover. It's important that other uh, aspects uh, of the pituitary function are replaced uh, appropriately, but in time and with appropriate exercise regimes, in many people or most people with Cushing's, it does uh, tend to recover. But of course, there are some patients who, despite everything we try and do, unfortunately still have problems. And, and I think that's an area where we need to understand more uh, about this lack of reversal that can occasionally happen in, in some people. I think it's more the case in Cushing's that people have ongoing issues with cognition, ongoing issues with uh, uh, thought processing, and at times ongoing issues with uh, different levels uh, of uh, mood change uh, and, and things like that. Um, Megan, I've got through those questions. Brilliant. So, so we I'm, just I'm going to go over to the chat, shall I? We actually just had a couple more through common email. Um, okay. First, so I'll just read them out for you quickly. So first of all, someone is asking for a list of tests to best diagnose uh, cyclic Cushing's patients. Am I saying yeah, that, that, that? That will be an entire webinar chat in itself, I'm afraid. Yeah. Um, so the first, quite the first reply to that is, it really depends on um, the likelihood that there is cyclical Cushing's in the first place. And that's something which requires a careful history um, a sense and, and a careful history taken by, by, by someone who, who you know, is familiar with Cushing's. It can be very, very challenging to make a diagnosis of cycle Cushing's. And it doesn't just come down to there's a perfect test because none of the tests we use are perfect, I'm afraid. Uh, and so a very careful history. And then it's a question of, well, what impact is the cycle of Cushing's having on that individual from uh, a, a physical, mental and metabolic perspective? Is there some evidence, for example, that they've got changes, for example, in glucose control if they're diabetic or blood pressure control, et cetera, uh, which will help uh, one actually establish a diagnosis? And then in terms of the tests, uh, then one manner or one way the test can be done is they can either have saliva or urinary tests done at the time when they appear to be quote unquote cycling in um, and indeed times when they quote unquote cycle out to see if there's a difference. Um, but when I, I sort of, I say that with a slight degree of caution because I have seen all too frequently people being armed with literally tens or even hundreds of saliva tubes and have measurements done at late at night and one test has been positive and they, then being described as being cyclical Cushing's. And of course, that's just unlikely to be the case if it's just on one test. So my answer to that question is cyclical Cushing's is challenging. Just doing lots and lots and lots and lots of tests is, is, is not gonna be uh, the right way to do it. It does depend on the history. It depends on how likely the condition is in the first place. Great, thank you so much. Um, and there's another more general one. Um, what tests do you think are most efficient for diagnosing Cushing's disease? So I said it again. And what tests do you think are most efficient for diagnosing Cushing's disease? So, so the answer to that is, is as we, so I'm one of a group of people who wrote the international guidelines on the, on the diagnosis of Cushing's. And we recommend, uh, one of three different tests to begin with, and then, and then use a different test for confirmation. So the three tests are the, the dexamethasone suppression test, urinary free cortisol test, uh, and the late night salivary cortisol test. In my own practice, I typically uh, will usually start with a dexamethasone suppression test. And actually the most recent data are that that's probably the most reliable, but it's not 
infallible by any means, because there's lots of reasons why a dexamethasone suppression test could either give a false negative or a false positive. The salivary cortisol and salivary cortisone testing we also use, and that can be very useful, particularly actually in someone who has already had Cushing's uh, and you're monitoring them for any recurrence because that will typically become positive before the other tests uh, become positive. Of all the tests, the urinary free cortisol is probably the least sensitive, but of course, if it's then elevated and people have got signs of it with Cushing's, then that makes it just much more likely they got Cushing's. So I think the take home message is that none of the tests are perfect. They do need to be done, but if Cushing's is being considered, there isn't a reason why someone shouldn't be able to do the test and get to the bottom of, do they have Cushing's? Definitely yes. Do they have Cushing's? Definitely no. Or do they have Cushing's? Not sure, there's some doubt. In the cases of doubt, then usually it's a case of having to repeat that, but leaving an interval to, to do it again. Because the danger is that what you can't do is go onto any differential diagnosis until you've actually established a, a diagnosis of Cushing's. Great, thank you. Um, this is so in depth, it's brilliant. Uh, there's one last one from the emails and we can move on to the chat. So um, does CRH stimulation help mimic the effects of mental stress and physical activity on someone with an ACTH uh, secreting pituitary gland microadenoma? Uh, oh, wow, that's an interesting question. Um, so corticotrophin releasing hormone, along with vasopressin, are the two main physiological ways of releasing ACTH uh, in the normal pituitary. If you've got an ACTH secreting tumor causing Cushing's from the pituitary, around about uh, 80 to 90% of them will respond to corticotrophin releasing hormone because they have the receptors on their cell surface that responds to the injection. But this is just a transient thing. If you have an ACTH secreting tumor, and if it is causing Cushing's, then the cortisol will feed back and completely switch off CRH. So if someone's got active Cushing's disease in the pituitary, they, they will have very little CRH. Giving CRH, apart from a, um, a test dose, and, and CRH only lasts for a few minutes, uh, isn't, isn't something that one would do for any, any therapy. Uh, I can't think that CRH being administered would be of any benefit. And indeed, there are CRH antagonists developed for the treatment of anxiety and depression. So um, the CRH itself wouldn't, wouldn't be useful as a therapy. We use it a lot, of course, for a diagnostic test. Uh, but if someone's got active Cushing's disease, their CRH levels will actually be low. Great. Thank you so much. Um, do you want to read out some of the questions from the chat box? Can you yeah, view it? Okay. Um, are there any risks of pregnancy whilst on a maintenance dose of hydrocortisone? Um, so the answer to that is yes, there are risks. So if you're on hydrocortisone, there's always risks. There's a risk of adrenal insufficiency for, for the reasons which hopefully you've been educated about. In pregnancy, um, the, the, absolutely the case that people on hydrocortisone can have a perfectly normal healthy pregnancy perfectly normal healthy babies and go through pregnancy without a hitch and actually that i would say is the majority however because the way the body handles the hydrocortisone as you go through pregnancy the amount of hydrocortisone gets mopped up more by the reservoirs that are in the in the body so typically um, in the latter part of pregnancy, say from about sort of weeks 25 onwards or 26 onwards, often people need a bit more hydrocortisone to stay healthy. And it's the same thing that happens if, if you've got someone who's got hypopituitarism and they go on to the oral contraceptive pill, they may need a bit more hydrocortisone than if you're not on the oral contraceptive pill. But other than that, there, there isn't uh, an issue. There's absolutely no issue for the baby at all because the placenta's got a brilliant piece of machinery, which means that it just chews up any cortisol from the mother and the baby doesn't see any at all. So hydrocortisone being cortisol, the baby doesn't see any of that. And so the, the baby will come to no harm whatsoever from, from the mother being on hydrocortisone. But in terms of the risk, it's just the general risks of being hydrocortisone, but uh, in, in, in it just needs to be monitored so that uh, there is usually a bit more hydrocortisone being given as the pregnancy progresses. And then just to be reassured by the fact that even though you're on more hydrocortisone, 
the baby's not going to see any, so it's not going to come to any harm at all, but it's doing you good. Um, then there's a question in the chat, which I've already answered about prednisolone. Um, and then there's a chat from Chris H. I'm a six-year-old female, hyperfit for 12 months, treated with, uh, I think that's uh, human growth, is that human H? Thyroxin growth hormone, I've read a little bit about DHEA. Can you explain what this is and should we be racing in the future? Okay. DHEA stands for dihydroepiandrostine diene, uh, and it's a hormone that's made from the adrenal gland, but it's really stimulated by ACTH. And so all of the adrenal hormones are stimulated um, by uh, ACTH. So if you lack ACTH from the pituitary, your adrenal typically is not going to be making DHEA. If you're a man, this is of no consequence at all, because if you've either got your own testosterone or you're on testosterone, that's a much, much more potent hormone than DHEA. And what DHEA is, is what we call a very weak androgen, whereas testosterone is a much stronger androgen. In a woman, it, it may make a difference in the sense that some women notice that they don't feel as well when they haven't got uh, androgens around. So this can occur in postmenopausal women and it can occur in other women. And so there are data where DHEA has been replaced. Actually, most of the data come from women who've got Addison's disease, so they lack their adrenal glands. But can DHEA be an option for the pituitary patient? Yes, it can be. Um, it, uh, it can be prescribed, usually at doses between 25 to 50 milligrams a day. But is that an advantage compared to, for example, some of the testosterone preparations that have been given to some postmenopausal women? Unlikely to be much different, uh, but there aren't data to uh, back that, that, that sort of assertion up. DHEA uh, can help. And so in, in the patients uh, in whom um, I, I've used this, you have the question uh, as to whether it's made a difference to them. Uh, you give patients you know, a trial of three to six months to see if it's helped. And if it hasn't, then I would, I would stop it. Can cause greasy skin. It can cause new onset acne, even in older people. So th those are the issues. So any, any androgen you give can cause those problems. So um, if, if Chris H is... Um, uh, well, sorry, Chris H is a female. So yeah, DHEA could be an option, but this is the sort of thing where you, you want to discuss it with your endocrinologist. Um, then I've got another one here. With acromegaly, you have it with normal GH, normal IGF-1. Sorry, with acromegaly, you can have it with normal GH, normal IGF-1 and still have acromegaly if the patient's malnourished, etc. Are there similar issues with Cushing's that would call lab results of cortisol and or ACTH? to hide the fact the patient has Cushing's? Um, no, not really. Um, so if, for example, you've had an operation on, on Cushing's and it's been successful, if the patient has not had treatment before the operation, if the Cushing's was due to a small tumor within the pituitary, if you remove that small tumor, the remaining pituitary is, if you like, asleep and often stays asleep for 12 to um, 18 months and then gradually wakes up and then the whole normal secretion of cortisol happens again. And uh, when you measure the serum cortisol, it's, it's very low. And they, you know, in that circumstance, people definitely um, do not have um, Cushing's at that stage. In terms of um, the, the cortisol and what the tests are showing you, Cushing's is tricky. It's tricky to diagnose, it's tricky to follow up, it's tricky to get right. Um, but if, for example, the, the morning cortisol level is very low after someone's had treatment, i.e. before the uh, pituitary is normally woken up, then there's definitely not Cushing's. It's trickier once the normal production of cortisol is woken up in the body, because, of course, what you want to establish is, is that they're normal or are people getting their Cushing's back? So the way that I usually manage that is by, with the, again, with the dexamethasone suppression test. And if the dexamethasone suppression test is normal and it was abnormal before the patient uh, had their operation that, then i'm relatively reassured there isn't cushions but of course i'm also looking at the patient and looking at the various um, changes that are going on uh, in their body so again there isn't a perfect test um, acth assays are not always brilliant and in fact if anything tend to overread i.e they tend to be positive when they can be actually negative so it's usually the other way around from the assay 
but depending on how the sample is handed, if the sample doesn't get to the lab quickly, you can get a falsely low reading. So all these things are, are, are things that one needs to be aware of when, when investigating Cushing's. Um, I don't know if that answered the question. I, I, I hope it does. Um, I am diagnosed with a 2.5 centimeter adenoma, non-functioning secreting tumor. My question is, I'm beginning to have regular heart palpitations and just wondering if it's got to do with my thyroid level, but I am currently on liver thyroxine medication. So great question. Um, the replacement doses that people need for liver thyroxine is harder to manage when it's due to the pituitary compared to due to lacking a, uh, a thyroid gland. And the reason for that is that we, when, when if you lack a thyroid gland, we measure the hormone from the pituitary, which is the TSH, because when you give sufficient amount of the levothyroxine, it then suppresses the TSH down to the normal range. Now in pituitary disease, you can't do that because the pituitary may not be making the, the, the TSH properly. So we aim to get the free T4 level, the actual hormone level into usually the upper end of the normal range. So my response to you is if the free T4 is in the normal range, then probably not, it's probably not the cause of your heartbeat, but of course, if the free T4 is the upper end of the normal range, it could be that you used to run a free T4 that was in the lower end of the normal range. So I think, again, this is something to discuss with your endocrinologist, because it might be, for example, that if your free T4 is right up at the upper end of normal, you might want 25 micrograms less to see if that, that helps. But again, please, please discuss that with your endocrinologist before making any changes. Um, but if your free T4 level is you know, down in the lower end of the normal range, then I think there's another cause most likely for palpitations. Uh, next question, for someone with osteoporosis, is there likely to be any potential differences uh, between taking either prednisolone or hydrocortisone for primary adrenal insufficiency? Uh, I think, as, I, as, you, as you probably already gathered, I think prednisolone is a blunter tool. Um, uh, and unless you're on doses that are down around about three milligrams a day or less, and that's quite low doses, I think there is a risk with prednisolone or a greater risk with prednisolone to contribute to, to osteoporosis. Um, I don't have clever, hard, uh, proven data for that. It's just the way that the, the drugs typically work. If you're on about 15 milligrams uh, to 20 milligrams of hydrocortisone, um, then the chance of that contributing to osteoporosis is very, very low in, indeed. Um, and so as you probably already gathered, I most usually use hydrocortisone. Um, and the next question is from Leon, and this might have to be the last question, I'm afraid. Um, I am currently on block and replace. They can't find a source of my Cushing's. IPSS is inconclusive and all scans are negative, CT, galley, and PET. I've been offered a bilateral genelectomy. Whoops. Um, in the meantime, I have been on metaropone as holding method. Last ACTH was 63. What I would like to know is how effective is block and replace as a long-term method with BLA better? Okay, really good question. And I'm, I'm sorry, you know, it's obviously pretty horrible for you to have to sort of be living with all this. So the first comment I'd make is that you can't always establish where the ACTH is coming from. And so you've had all these uh, tests uh, and they haven't managed to establish whether it's on the pituitary or an ectopic source, et cetera, or if it's thought to be an ectopic source to actually find out where the source is. In those circumstances, I will sit down with patients to have a long discussion about the risks and benefits of having a bilateral adrenalectomy, which will fix the problem, uh, but you will then swap it for being a, dependent on adrenal replacement therapy for the rest of your life, hydrocortisone and fludrocortisone. But that will fix the problem. It doesn't fix where the ACTH is coming from. So you'd still need to be scanned and monitored for wherever the ACTH is coming from, be that the pituitary or be that from an ectopic source. And really, can someone manage in the long term and block and place? Absolutely. But you may find that it's quite a high pill burden, quite a high tablet burden, depending on how much um, uh, uh, metaropone you're on, and therefore can be quite an ordeal to keep taking. So I think the other, the other thing I'd say is that it may be that you could be on block and replace if it's working for you for you know, a year or two years or a number of years and still be monitored. And then it may be during that period of time possible to find out where the source of the ACTH is. But I think this, again, is something to sit down and go through with your endocrinologist to work out the risks and the benefits and actually how that's fitting with where you're at in your particular life. So, for example, a young woman who wants to get pregnant 
can't be unblock and replace. Um, and, and therefore a bilateral adrenalectomy in that circumstance would work. Whereas if, uh, if someone is saying, well, I'm, a, I'm fine on my block and replace, I'm feeling okay, I'm perfectly happy to stay on it, you can monitor me and let's see if the actual tumor declares itself uh, in the future. Uh, next question, what's the most accurate test for an insulinoma? That's not really pituitary, so I'm, I'm gonna skip that question. Um, uh, the short answer is, if insulinoma is confirmed biochemically, and that's the first most important thing, uh, uh, the, the most accurate test nowadays is probably an endoscopic ultrasound scan. Um, next question is, what's the best way to diagnose MEN1? Usually, the MEN1 is being diagnosed from genetic screening now um, in families who've got a predisposition. Um, uh, if the gene test is negative, of course, it makes it much less likely. Uh, if someone has, for example, parathyroid disease and a pituitary disease, but there's no family history and the gene test is negative, then it, it makes it much less likely that it's any anyone. Um, I think, um, Megan, that's it. I'm afraid I really have to to go. <laughs> I'm this sorry. Um, but I'm very I am I'm very, very happy indeed if, if they want to send you some questions to see if I can answer any more. And of course I'd be only too happy to do this again when I when I haven't double booked myself. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, please do send over um, questions if you're happy for me to send them on. Um, my email address, I think I emailed everyone earlier, so it's just megan at pituitary.org.uk. Uh, thank you, John, so much for giving up your time, even though you were no, this evening, and for all of your expertise on this. It was really, really interesting and helpful. Pleasure, and, and good evening to everyone else. All the best. Bye-bye. Brilliant. Thanks. Thank you.